Welcome back to video 17 of the AR-15 high rail gas block machining video series. First off, apologies for the long hiatus. Um, I had been waiting on some tooling that took a long time to show up. Um, but in this video we're going to talk about uh, the other functions of the soft jaws that we uh, made in the last video. And what I'm doing here is I'm just sawing up some of the blocks um, that will eventually become gas blocks. I ended up having a lot of problems with uh, blade breakage on this saw. And I've gone through enough blades to where I decided I need to figure out what's going on. So I ended up taking it apart and discovering that um, one of the large pulleys was not coplanar with the other pulley. So it was only riding halfway on the pulley whereas the other one was completely on the pulley, so I had to do a little bit of manual machining to fix that. Okay, another aspect of these vice jaws that I made uh, will help me out when I'm initially starting a run of gas blocks, when I have um, just the squared blocks of solid steel that need to be drilled and and uh, the bores milled and all that. So I have a six inch vise, so I'm only able to fit six of them in the vise jaws. So with these being eight and a half inches, I can now fit eight of them in there. And um, I'd like to keep everything at eight just because that's how my fixtures are designed. So if I can just like do eight from the start and then eight on fixture two and then eight, or fixture one and eight on fixture two and then milling the backs off of eight of them I can keep everything at eight so that's where these bottom holes come in um, previously I was having problems uh, clamping all, uh, numerous blocks at once without them kind of shifting in the vise because some of them would uh, clamp tightly and some of them would be a little bit loose um, so I'm going to uh, design these holes in there that might help alleviate that problem. We'll see. But uh, those holes are drilled and threaded for, again, some more bolts. And if we uh, turn the blocks on, these are eight blocks. It's kind of hard to... There, you can kind of see them there. That's eight blocks. So each one of these lower bolt holes is centered on one of these blocks. And it's also centered in this direction, vertically. So I'm thinking that I can put eight blocks in there, clamp the, the movable vice jaw down against them, and then snug up each one of these bolts just to make sure that they're all firmly seated against the fixed vice jaw so everything can uh, you know remain square um, this I'm gonna use this uh, perhaps in conjunction with also running a, a piece of aluminum wire across the face of the jaw just to make sure that everything is you know seated properly and another uh, uh, sort of advantage of these jaws is you can run that wire around the side, stick it out here, and then wrap it around the bolts on the end to hold it in place. So we'll see how that works. So since these are uh Part of these are just saw cut. I need to um, vertically align it with the one, two, three block and then clamp it in. And then the other ones can clamp to that so everything is um, nice and square when I face the tops off. And then I can go through and individually clamp each one. I could, use, could have used just some aluminum welding wire or something, uh, but I tried that. And I, while it works, I can't get all the blocks completely, you know, lined up perfectly that way. 
So this way it works a little it's more it's a little bit more convenient. Here are a couple of uh, just oops moments. Here, those the last two blocks were a lot taller than the other ones because I was still dialing in the bandsaw cuts. Um, and at least we know the e-stop works really well. But once I got the bulk of the material removed, then I could just all I'm trying to do here is just go down enough to get a nice surface. And I've taken to dry machining um, when using the space mill. I used to always use coolant, but dry machining is just a lot less messy for for that size of a cutter. And I haven't really noticed anything. You know, the surface finish is fantastic still. Um, I haven't really noticed a decrease in tool life, so uh, I'm going to keep doing it. The only downside is you'll get a lot of metal dust that you can really smell. The surface finish is just really amazing. This also produces an enormous pile of blue chips that just looks like a big pile of mealworms or something. So here's another little tip. Uh, when you have a lot of parts like that, you can use a large C-clamp as sort of a, a truck to pick them up and carry them from place to place. I also use a C-clamp to hold everything um, together because there's going to be a lot of lateral side forces here when I do the milling. So that just prevents one from like, mainly the outer edge ones from moving over and shifting in the vise. So for the drilling, I uh, indicate from this side. As I was drilling all these, I was also continuing to saw up blocks in the background. Save time. Then flip them over in the vise, and then we indicate from the other side, which is the same side we indicated for the drilling. And that way, any kind of um, it'll it'll just ensure that these uh, next machining operations will be aligned with those bores. Here again my C-clamp truck comes in handy for uh, moving blocks in and out.
Okay, the next function of these soft jaws uh, involve that channel that I milled in the back with these two blind bolt holes. So <clears throat> once the gas blocks are done, um, they need to be p drilled and pinned into barrels. And that's a little bit tricky because the the gas block itself needs to be perfectly indexed or rotationally aligned with the 12 o'clock position of the barrel or else obviously the front side is going to be canted. We can't have that so um, how are we going to do this? Alright so I've, I uh, designed up another fixture to hold the barrel and index it and I'll uh, turn that on right here. Okay. So what this fixture does is a bar, it's a couple of pieces of steel, but it's this long bar that rides in that channel. And the reason I have it riding in the channel is so um, it will accommodate different barrel lengths. It kind of can just move all the way out and to uh, accommodate rifle length, carbine length, mid-length barrels. And, I'll, and I'm going to do something else for pistol barrels here because they're so short. Um, I might think of something different. But anyway, that, so that's what it is. So uh, what this will allow me to do is uh, clamp a barrel rigidly in the vise. And then I can CNC drill the holes and run the taper reamer in there. So the way I, um, the way I designed this uh, sort of indexing fixture is um, I have uh, instead of trying to drill a hole or you know that that the barrel extension will slide into or, or something like that um, I wanted something more positive and uh, I'm kind of using what's known in the machining industry as um, uh, v blocks, but this is sort of like a custom made V block. So it's a 45 degree um, faces here, and these little ears sticking out are basically just to hold the barrel while I'm getting it set up. And then I have a 45 degree chamfer that runs right through there. And what this does is it uh, it will index the barrel, and I'll go ahead and turn the barrel on so you can see what it looks like. So there it is. Um, the uh, so the barrel will index um, in the Z axis and in the um, Y axis this way. The X axis is is a little bit adjustable, but but that's okay. Um, and the two indexing points or or registering points are right here and right here. So when you push the barrel up in there. Um, it will it will register right in there. Now, if you look around the other side, <clears throat> oops, all right, uh, you'll see the barrel has a uh, what's called an indexing pin at the top, which is basically just an eighth inch dowel pin, and it is perfectly uh, lined up with the gas tube. Um, or the gas port on the barrel because they're done in the same operations at the factory. So what we can do is um, drop that indexing pin into this 45 degree V block sort of thing and then it will now index it rotationally to be perfectly 90 degrees off from your Z. And then the um, distance between the face of this the face of this block here butts up against the face of the fixed vice jaw and the distance from here to the center line of the barrel is the exact same distance as the top of the rail, this, the flight deck portion here, going back to a nautical terminology, because it kind of looks like an aircraft carrier, I think. Um, it, uh, it's the same distance from there to the center line of the, the bore. <clears throat> so, um, so we have a way to uh, index it now. Now if we turn on our movable vice jaw again, um, the, the Z height of this barrel is now right in line with the lower uh, bolt holes. So we can um, turn the, the lower bolts on 
and you can see now you can um, tighten any one of these bolts to apply pressure to anywhere you want onto the barrel and so when you clamp it down you can uh, run this bolt in the last bolt happens to line up with that sling swivel socket hole so that'll make sure that the barrel is not canted or anything uh, in the x-axis or I guess uh, it would be in the z-axis along the x-axis and that will push the vice or that will push the uh, gas block securely up against the fixed vice jaw and then um, this bolt can push up against the barrel extension and register that barrel up into this uh, V block and get that all s squared away and then this bolt here can be tightened up against the barrel which will push the barrel hard uh, and and also push the gas port up hard into the um, the gas block it's, it's not totally necessary uh, I don't guess because the barrel um, is this is a 0 0.750 reamed hole so it's a pretty pretty snug fit when you try to slide this onto a barrel but still you'd like to make sure that it's um, as snug as possible when you're drilling these holes and then you can come in and um, drill your holes here and here and then run your taper reamer down and um, and that's how we'll pin in the barrels. So let's get to it. So uh, I've been using these Starrett Intense Pro Die bandsaw blades from McMaster. And uh, they work great, except that they were breaking. And that was uh, a result of my bandsaw being kind of screwed up. Uh, not so much the blades. The, br the blades themselves, they work great. So what I'm doing here is just sawing up some uh, scrap material that I had laying around to make some of the components of the barrel pinning fixture. Here I'm just using the 3 8 inch variable flute end mill just to get a flat, a nice flat surface that's square. And then this is my uh, 3 quarter inch 2 flute indexable end mill. That works great um, and I use, I cut dry with it as well and it just leaves a, a really, really fantastic surface finish. I mean it feels like glass. So I'm just hogging out the main part of the material here and when I lose coolant pressure and that results in a giant mound of steaming blue chips and a smoldering end mill. Of course this was all done before I switched coolant. And then I'm just doing some finish passes to get a nice surface there. And then I go through right down the middle with the uh, 90 degree chamfer mill and then flip it over, I mill a little uh, keyway 
and drill a hole there. And now I'm milling a, a boss that runs the length of it so I can kind of clock all these things together and make sure that they're all um, nice and square with each other. And they, don't, and they can't shift around. You can kind of see the little keyways, I guess you'd call them. I also made it reversible just in case I have to uh, go at a barrel from the other side. Which I can't imagine why I would, but I figured why not while it's in the mill. Just go ahead and make it reversible. So that's what that rear slot on the back's for. It just slides in there and then screws down. And here is one of the early prototypes I made, or I had made several years ago. Um, I'm just using it as sort of a spacer. So here's how the barrel clocks into position. The little indexing pin rides right in, right in the uh, little 90 degree uh, chamfer groove. And then one of these socket head cap screws pushes it up into place so the extension is indexed vertically and it's rock solid. So now that we now we know that the indexing pin is perfectly perpendicular to the mill. So before we get into drilling and pinning gas blocks I wanted to do a few just some test cutting so I spot drill a hole there and then I come in with um, a number 31 drill which is 0 0.12 inches in diameter and I'm not running cool in here just because I don't think it's necessary and this is more of a sort sort of a hands-on operation this is a, I think a cobalt drill bit I'm going to uh, switch to carbide at some point because I'm going to be cutting through a nitrided surface which is extremely hard now the traditional way you do this is hand ream it with a 2-0 taper pin reamer as, as you see me doing here that takes a long time to get down to the proper depth so what I wanted to do was write a program to do this via CNC. And <clears throat> unfortunately what I found is these taper pins, while they're very close in size, they're not uniform. You might get a larger one, you might get a smaller one by just a little bit. So it really needs to be hand fit the pins really need to be hand fitted in there uh, but what I wanted to do since it takes such a long time to do this uh, reaming because there's so far you have to go I wanted to CNC most of it so it comes down uh, to a certain depth but not deep enough to seat the pin and then do the rest by hand so I did a lot of experimentation here trying to dial this in and um, and I did that first hole by hand just so I could measure uh, how far the how far the pin protrudes when it comes to the point where you can actually knock it in place, and then how far it moves. And then here's a CNC operation of just doing the the reaming, and I just do it in one shot. The chips are pushed out the bottom, but in reality they just kind of it's just like a real soft spongy material that just clogs up the glutes there doesn't really hurt anything so through trial and error I discovered that um, the proper depth reamed hole allows a pin to protrude from the surface about 
uh, hundred and seventy thousandths and that's before you knock it in that's just putting it in by hand Okay, so what just happened here was uh, I started a program and then suddenly something knocked the safety glasses from my face and hit my camera tripod, breaking one of the legs off, and then my camera fell to the ground. That was the problem right there because it was about 2 a.m. or something. The drill chuck that I was using... Um, does not have a way to secure the spindle so I locked it with a wrench and I forgot to take it off so be careful folks alright so there was just a fully CNC um, reamed hole there that's about as far as I could get with that drill chuck uh, here's some just some pictures of the first 10 that I wanted to send off for finishing um, just to test you know the finish and the tolerances and stuff see if they changed uh, so I just package them up they fit nicely like that And then I got them back about four or five days later, and I wanted to do this sort of Tom Lipton style, um, but the audio didn't pick up again. You could barely hear what I was saying, so I'm just going to voice do a voiceover. But um, they came back. They looked great. They were covered in oil, individually wrapped. Very nicely done. <clears throat> they were also bead blasted but they were just completely saturated with oil now these had a bit of a problem and if you recall in one of my earlier videos uh, I was getting some um, a bit of thin material when I was machining the um, rotation limiter the material on the sides was so thin that the cutter would kind of push it and bow it out a little bit well, I kind of fixed that to where it wouldn't do that, but when subjected to the high heat of nitriding, that area was thin enough to where it bowed out from that or dimpled in. I've since fixed that by making that sling swivel socket um, post wider. Here's what was taking me so long to get the video out. I wanted the video to be complete to actually show pinning one in a barrel, so I had to order these tool extensions, unfortunately from China, because I couldn't find any ER8 ones domestically, and that's what I needed to make clearance. So here we are. Uh, let's go ahead and pin one into a barrel so you can see how that's done. This is the first time I'm doing it, so there there's a few hiccups that I'll have to iron out, but... The uh, concept is sound. So we mount a barrel just like we did before. I showed before, and this is a, a, a real gas block ready to go on. And uh, <clears throat> this is for a customer. This is one of, um, I was selling those other ones as, as blemishes for $65. There's nothing wrong with them, it just has that dimple that pops out on the side or kind of bows inwards. Um, this is not one of those, but. Uh, it's otherwise the same. So I just indicate in my three points and I'm going to start out with a spot drill to get through that um, tough nitriding, nitri nitrided surface. And I leave a dwell at the bottom so it's just uh, perfectly concentric cone and you can 
see the barrel flexed a little bit downwards there. So I need to put, uh, that was one of the things I wanted to see if this was rigid enough. I need to put like a, a, a big standoff or something underneath that barrel to support it vertically from being pushed down by the drill. It's supported somewhat by that socket head cap screw going into the sling swivel socket stud. Um, or sorry, the sling swivel socket. But it still kind of bends everything down a little bit. There's just a lot of force to put on there. So this is one of my tool extensions. I had to do that because my drill truck would not clear that uh, handguard cap. So I needed the smallest extension possible. And unfortunately, it, the collet is not holding it tight enough because that's a three and a half millimeter collet. Probably need a three millimeter collet, so I went ahead and ordered one of those. But that's a carbide drill, and uh, that pretty much broke the tips off. So I put in a replacement, and I tightened it down as best I could again. And then I'm trying air here to see if that helps anything, because the oil just kind of tends to make the chips hang around. And it's just that collar just can't hold that drill tight enough no matter how hard I torque it down. So I need a smaller collar for sure. So I went back and went to uh, one of my cobalt drills and just put it in a drill chuck and then just. Uh, touched off that tool just for this one time to get through it. And it makes it through okay, but uh, man, that nitriding is really hard. In fact, this pretty much trashed that drill. Um, I need to order some more car uh, carbide drills. And you can see the force, how much force is flexing that barrel downwards. So I need to put something underneath the barrel to support it. But that was really my only issues here. So then moving on, um, next we're going to do the reaming, and of course this reaming stops short of a full ream, so I can finish it up by hand, but it does the majority of it. And it started slipping in the collet on this one too. So this collet was was small enough to be able to to uh, completely clamp it. I just must not have had it clamped down tight enough. So once, once that part's done, I can switch to the hand reamer to finish them up. Obviously these need more reaming than they normally would because of the reamer slipping in that collet. It didn't go down quite as far as I wanted it to. But.
So I went ahead and took it out of the vise and took it over here to my workbench to kind of do the remainder of it. I got the first one in just so it wouldn't shift around and now I'm working on the front one. And it's sort of a back and forth process until you get it. I, I can tell how far it's going to go in by when I actually hammer it. And I know it still needs to go a lot. The ream still needs to go deeper. So it's just kind of back and forth until you get it just right. Okay, so I got those two in, and they're they're right in the middle to where they're equidistant protrusion on each side. Now I'm going to install the gas tube. Even though um, the customer will have to remove this when he gets it, uh, so he can install it onto his upper receiver. Uh, I'm just going to go ahead and and put the the roll pin in and everything so he can. Um, he, he'll have to tap it out and put it back in. So I'm just lining up the hole in the gas tube with the hole on the side. Which has to be amazingly precise. <laughs> because if it doesn't line up even a little bit, that, that roll pin won't go through. So it was actually some trial and error getting that just right in the, in the code when I was machining that hole. Here I'm using uh, Grace roll pin punches, the short ones, the starter punches, because that's really all you need for this one. It has a little like ball in the middle so it, it can't slip off, and they work fantastic. The Grace brass hammer works great too for this, for this job. So there it is, it's all pinned in, and this is just kind of showing it off a little bit. This was the one of the test ones I sent out after I, I got the 10 back. They weren't quite right. I made a test one after I updated the code and updated the model a little bit to take care of some tolerance issues. And it came back and it was good. So, so there's what it looks like on a barrel. This particular customer is just going to use um, Magpul MOE plastic handguard rail. So that's why I put the handguard cap and the delta ring on for him. Checking er everything makes make sure everything fits. The sling swivel socket fits. The rotation limiter works. 
very positive stops. <clears throat> Check make sure the bayonet slips on easily. It does, locks up nice and snug. So there we have it. I, uh, I've gone from having an idea to modeling it on a computer to camming it, programming a machine to cut it and turn it into a physical part. And I'd have to say it turned out very well. So one of the other delays of getting this video out aside from waiting on those tool extensions was that while I was waiting on those I went ahead and started production on these after I got all the geometry bugs worked out. Um, so probably by the time you see this video I'll have a number of them in stock. Um, contact me if you want to have one. Uh, they weigh under four ounces, which is less than the standard front sight base. Here are the initial ones that came back from nitriding with the little dimple. I'm letting those go for $65. Um, the pre-release sale is going to be $87. And the retail price is still being calculated, the normal retail price. It'll probably be north of $125. I'll probably do a video in the near future detailing um, the advantages that this gas block offers as well as uh, perhaps some shooting video. We'll see. If you like what you see, please subscribe to my channel, uh, visit my website, read my blog. Uh, you can follow us on Facebook and Instagram or heck, if you just want to send a message saying I like what you're doing. That's awesome too. Uh, so with that, um, thanks for watching and uh, stay tuned for the next video.